actually, I was looking at your LinkedIn earlier, and it says that you've been, I guess, uh, counting the acquisition, you've been, uh, you pushed like five years now? That's uh, Cloud Technologist was a cool title. I like that. I think I'm going to have to have to use that for myself. But yeah. you've, you've been now with, um, I mean, so 1111 is, uh, you know, Island. And I mean, there's, there's some other, you guys, it, it wasn't just a rebrand, right? This was a, a roll up as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've got a slide that we can talk directly to that, but, right. um, you know, 11 has been built through acquisition for the most part to this point. And I came in with the second acquisition. So I mean, kind of two acquisitions in December of 21, I was in the second of those two. And now with, with the combined situation, right about four and a half years with the company. So if yeah, let's, I mean, let's get into it, you know, okay. uh, if you got, if you're, if you got, if you got something to cover this, I'll, I won't steal too, <laughs> I won't get too distracted here. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, generally speaking, the, the presentation I have is, um, kind of, a what, what our mission is as a company, how mm -hmm. the companies came, came to be. And then, then we kind of start digging into what we have from a services perspective. So wonderful. It's uh floor is yours. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So um, my name is Brian Knudsen and I've been with 1111 through, and we'll talk about how the companies came to be, but through acquisition, roughly about four and a half years now. And we've, we've been putting together something that's, that's really kind of cool. So I'm excited to, to talk about that a bit. Um, my role specifically is as the director of product market intelligence. Um, what that fancy title means is that I spend a lot of time looking at the market, understanding what customers want, um, what analysts are saying mm -hmm. um, the market's going to go to, what, um, you know, just kind of the the community as a whole is speaking of. So a big part for me is uh, what, what I like to call the hallway track at conferences, um, just going around talking to people, understanding what, what needs they have and what they're looking for, um, trying to, you know, the, the old saying of trying to skate to where the puck's going to be, trying to figure out that trajectory um, through kind of taking all these pieces into, into account. So I get involved pretty heavily with competitive, with um, product roadmap, with um, specifically I'm on the product innovation team where we think about the, the long-term part of the roadmap. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff. I, I love that. It's, it's a good, good place for me to be at this point through very, a very varied career path I've had up to this point it gives me a lot of different interesting perspectives on things. How many years down the road are you trying to look? I mean, like what is, I mean, when you start talking about product for, you know, a company now, your size, I mean, is this a three year or five year farther, shorter? Like what's, what is that really? Generally shorter than that at this point, um, due to a couple things. Um, one being the fact that we, we are a relatively new company and we're still trying to figure out, I mean, we know what our core messaging is, what our core focus is. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're still kind of growing through acquisition primarily at this stage, kind of a year into it. So there's there's a lot of still just figuring out what we have and what we can do with what we have. I mean, that's a little bit of snowmer though, because I mean, you know, eleven eleven is new, but you know, like Island is is not a new company. I mean, this is a very right. mature, you know, very mature business and, and practice and service delivery and everything else. I mean, right? Absolutely, yeah. So. Um, the company I came in through, like you said, is Island, and we've that company had been around for 25 years uh, yeah. before it was acquired into 1111 a little over a year ago. Okay. So definitely have some some long term strategy there. Um, the company Island as a company pivoted several times in what their business model was. So those of us that are that come in through that acquisition are very experienced at you know being able to to move quickly and pivot, and of course. The other aspect that goes into how far out do we really look is the fact that, you know, we're in the cloud security space and that space changes very fast. Mm -hmm. And anyone who thinks they know what the industry is going to look like three to five years from now is, is, <laughs> is deluding themselves and or their customers. Um, because, sure. I mean, think about three years ago where we were at. Uh, we were, we heard that there's something going on in China. We don't know what it is. Um, and the world got turned upside down within a couple months of that. So sure, sure. We, we, we have to understand the fact that we're um, the most important thing really is to be agile and to be prepared to jump on things when it makes sense to jump on them. Um, and, and then sometimes it's the smart decision is to wait and see how things play out and not address something until it's that time has, um, you know, 
gone on long enough to show which direction things are headed. So it's it's definitely a tough place to be in innovation, but it's I love it. Super exciting. Okay. So yeah, um, moving forward with um, what our mission is as a company. So 1111 as a company, the mission is to have kind of a single platform for customers to ensure their apps and data, you know, those are the two core pieces of any business, are always running, accessible, and protected. So any one of those by themselves is, is a business by itself, really. Uh, being able to, to run your infrastructure, being able to make it accessible, being able to protect it. Um, without all three, though, you really can't be in a situation where you can be assured of access to those apps and data. And so our focus is really to focus on that and, and through kind of three pieces that we'll, we'll talk in a bit more depth of cloud connectivity and security, making sure that those things are there for our customers' customers or our customers' employees to be able to serve those customers and always mm -hmm. focused on that aspect of things. Um, talked a little bit about the company already. We've we've grown through acquisition to this point. So 1111 as an entity has existed for not quite two years now. Uh, they spent most of that first year really investigating the market, trying to figure out where the challenges are, where um, more attention is necessary um, to really help customers. And then towards the end of 2021, started into acquisition mode. Um, the first two companies being Green Cloud Defense and Island. I, again, I come from the Island side of things. Um, we had a really well-known name in the cloud market, particularly around backup and disaster recovery. Mm -hmm. Very strong partnerships with Veeam and Zerto, as well as VMware and HPE. Um, a lot of the technologies that we use under the covers coming from those four companies. Having having had that um, that history and and that that place in the market, if you will, is a big part of why 1111 acquired us. Um, a lot of what we have going forward as a company is built on that bedrock. Uh, Green Cloud Defense came in, you know, at the beginning of December, we came in at the end of December. Green Cloud had a, had a similar um, cloud strategy to what Island had, so they merged very well together. They also brought in a um, very solid security solution um, and, and, and product, mainly mainly around services more than anything else, um, and some managed services a, a, along with that. Um, heavily focused on enabling managed service providers to be able to do their business. So the two together melded very, very well together. Um, and we we started cooking very, very quickly after that. Um, come January of, of 22, we were off to the races. Then as, as we got into the middle part of 22, they started building out um, really kind of the connectivity piece of things. So we had the security in the cloud pretty well, pretty well in hand, uh, pretty solidly in hand. So when when you see the the April, May, July timeframe was really focused on connectivity solutions and brought in some really, really awesome talent. Um, it's been awesome to work with them. Is 1111 in the digital alpha portfolio? Is that part of your financial backing? Or I mean, like Unitas Global, right? You know, there's, I mean, digital alpha has cut up and Remerged and sold off so many companies in the last year. I'm just curious, like, yeah, are you guys part of that, or you know, are these assets you've acquired, you know, um, opportunistically, you know, through that that activity? Yeah. So, 1111 is actually um, a company that is owned by Tiger Infrastructure Partners. Okay. Um, so they're they're an investment and in, and in growth firm. So they buy companies to um, that are that are on the verge of of being big in a lot of cases, or are, are new like 1111 was. So they they formed 1111 as part of a Tiger infrastructure um, uh, move, uh, an organization designed to build something specific. So mm -hmm. that the whole idea of saying data is everywhere, applications are everywhere. We need to connect those pieces. We need to secure them, and we need to to make them cloud enabled, and and make them cloud smart. So. They formed that company, um, and then, then, like I said, did a lot of investigation, started acquiring those companies. So um, it is it is a private equity situation. Um, so you know, there's there's only single investor in all of this, um, where they they invest the funds initially. Um, we have some debt 
that that we've used to do some of these acquisitions and and to build things. Um, but the financial uh, attention that we give within eleven eleven is very much about making sure we're not over leveraged from from a loan perspective. So we're not we're not that startup that is going to be running in the red for years. We're we're being very careful to make sure we're in the black the whole time, so that there's sure. there's no um, instability coming from from the financial situation. Especially, I mean, the the way the finance environment has gone over the last year shows that that's a that's a really good strategy for us up to this point. Yeah, for sure. Um. So then kind of the big news kind of coming at towards the end of the year is, is the SunGuard acquisition that we did. So obviously SunGuard, most people probably know about SunGuard more than any of these other, other logos. Um, of course, they probably know that SunGuard hasn't had a, um, a, a great business situation the last, the last couple of years or so. Um, so having gone through bankruptcy and whatnot, 1111 was able to broker a really good deal for the cloud managed services and the availability services pieces of SunGuard in the United States. So specifically those those assets, um, including some data center assets, um, but most of the data center assets that SunGuard had went, went to a different company. Most of the um, EMEA based pieces went to, went to another company, but we do um, have a healthy amount of, of the managed services, the things that people are used to for, hey, we're gonna do DR with SunGuard, we're gonna send our backups to SunGuard. That was all included in this. Um, a lot of the the private cloud type of solutions that, that many, many people are using with SunGuard got brought over. So they bring a very healthy portfolio of solutions um, that um, are, are highly automated, um, highly leveraging um, strong procedures and, and policies around that. So very, um, not, not that the rest of the companies haven't been, I mean, Island's been doing ISO 9001 for, for years now. Um, in fact, that as we record this, we're coming up on another cycle of that. So everyone's real, <laughs> real excited about that. Um, but SunGuard is, is known for helping to manage large, complex enterprise type environments. So it brings a healthy, um, perspective on that and a healthy book of business along with that, that um, right now, we're just kind of getting into the stages of understanding what all they have, how it melds with what we already have within 11.11, and um, starting to figure out what do we keep? how do Where do we put the people within the existing organization? So, you know, that's, that's going to be a long term, um, essentially doubled the size of the company from an employee perspective. So there's a lot for us to work through on that, yeah. um, figuring out which backend systems. I mean, anyone who's been through an acquisition, this is this is not one of the biggest ones I've been through. I've been through quite a few acquisitions on both sides of the fence, but it's, it's no small deal at this point. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how the, the companies come to be at this point. I mean, so like Island was a huge VMware vCloud partner and a huge mm -hmm. Veeam and Zerto partner and was this really massive entity that not a lot of people knew about that had this very interesting, um, you know, backup and DR business. Um, you know, looking at these logos and, and just listening to you talk through it, I mean, what, what percentage of the business now is, you know, backup and DR focused and cloud, you know, or cloud connectivity. I mean, the connectivity here is, you know, a lot of these were, uh, you know, even, even with the Metro assets deployed in data centers, I mean, these are aggregation networks. So you're providing last mile to companies connecting for just general DIA and you're doing the whole, whole thing end to end. But I mean, yep. kind of like, you know, when we look at and say, you know, cloud versus backup versus DR versus connectivity and security, like what 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 percentage of this business actually fits in those different buckets? Yeah, we don't we don't have specific percentages that we share. Um, yeah. But what I will say is that of if if you take the SunGuard piece of all this out, Island was definitely the dominant of of all the businesses, both from a um, number of customers and from a uh, revenue perspective. Mm -hmm. So definitely a lot of a lot of backup and DR customers. I'd say yep. our, our number one group of customers is is in that data protection space. Um, that said, the cloud piece of things is um, is a per per customer more revenue aspect of things. Um, so there's a pretty healthy business from from that perspective there as well. The security piece is is a growing space, um, growing very fast and very, um, it's a very chaotic space I've, I've come to find, um, as, as things are changing very quickly. Um, 
Static One came in as, as kind of um, the biggest chunk of the connectivity business that we're doing right now. Um, though the the original 1111 team that started with Tiger Infrastructure Partners is very, um, very strongly connected to the connectivity space as well. Okay. So there's 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 a lot of really deep relationships there, but that book of business is currently growing and. Um, you know, by the by the time you share this with anybody, we'll probably have launched um, kind of the the eleven eleven core connectivity product based on those acquisitions we did this this last summer. So, um, so this this is how you got to where you are. But like, mm -hmm. so let's talk about where you are now and yeah. like where you where you're going over the next 12, 18 months. Yep, absolutely. So, like I stated, with with the mission is is to create. A platform. It, it is to create a set of technologies that customers can plug into and, and utilize what they need for for their particular needs. Um, so three pillars that that we really focus on: the cloud, the connectivity, and the security. As we mentioned before, um, and, and we'll dig deep into each of these. But at a high level, trying to connect all these pieces, none of these pieces really should be considered individually. They should all be considered as a whole. You know, if you're going to move stuff to the cloud you need to know how you're going to connect it. And of course, the number one fear of moving to the cloud is the security aspect of things. So a lot of companies, you know, started overlaying security on their cloud platforms and would say, okay, we're going to offer firewall. And I'm going to ask you this question because you list EDR and email. So I don't think I'm throwing you, you know, under the bus here per se. No. But, you know, I think originally a lot of these, a lot of cloud vendors were offering, you know, security and saying, okay, we can secure your cloud environment. But reading email and EDR, this is... Uh, more enterprise focused. So are you actually deploying on-premise firewalls at a corporate office and putting a, you know, EDR in place and then backing that up with your own SOC and then you're nodding your head. So I'm saying yep. that's a yes. And then let's, let's talk about what this actually means in terms of the market landscape, you know, of, you know, how you comprise your SOC. What does this actually look like? Who you're partnering with for these different components? What EDR, what SIM, what firewalls, you know, how, yeah. you know, what are these different blocks? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll jump to, to my security slide here in a second. Um, but wanted to key off of one point that you made there is that, you know, security in the cloud is important, but it's one part of a greater whole. So the solution around security should not just, unless you're 100% in the cloud, your security solution is not 100% in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So you've got to consider it with all of your assets, which include, you know, employ laptops. Um, as, as they go around the country, they're working from home, they're sitting in coffee shops. You, you've got to consider that part. And that that is definitely where the EDR piece comes in. So, so, I mean, part of this for me is, I mean, just bluntly, right? Like there's, when you look at, service providers that only do security and all they do mm -hmm. is MDR and all, I mean, that's literally, that's all they do versus companies that are, that are combining all these pieces together. And there's value in having, you know, you never want to be in a situation where you've got fingers pointing at each other and it's not me, it's me who actually has, owns what, I mean, that becomes a bad situation, but then at the same mm -hmm. time, um, you know, I I just shake my head when I find out like, oh, we went with, you know, Bob's house of security vendor. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, there's like three people there. You know, how how is this an, an effective security posture for yourself? Or, you know, um, you know, oh, we partnered with fill in the blank EDR because we got a good deal reselling them. And you're like, you know, the R&D budget for a market leading EDR platform is five times the annualized revenue of the platform that you selected. Like what was the decision-making process with yeah. that? So, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, you know, so I come from a place of, uh, uh, how to put this, um, skepticism, healthy skepticism. Yep. When people say, Oh, we're a security vendor now. Yes. <laughs> so. Which, which, which shows that you understand the security market because everything starts with skepticism. Um, and, and should. So most of our security products, and there is one exception that, that I'll talk to, um, are based on Fortinet's platform. So okay. we've, we've invested very heavily, and that goes back all the way through the Green Cloud Defense and, and even beyond that um, with relationships with Fortinet. So very, very tightly tied with that. I talked a little bit about you know Island, and, and you've, you've mentioned it as well, very close ties with Veeam and Zerto. Um, you know, Island was the largest customer and partner of Veeam and Zerto for hands down. Uh, no one was really kind of touching that. Similar with with what Green Cloud Defense brought to the portfolio on 
the Fortinet relationship. So very, very strong there. Um, they're viewed as, as one of our very top tier partners um, in, in building solutions on top of that. So when we deploy our managed EDR product, it is Fortinet's EDR solution that we are managing for customers, both on-premises in the cloud, wherever, wherever they have endpoint devices. And are you using their SIM as well? Yep, um, okay. using their SIM, using their firewall, both um, virtually within our, our cloud, uh, the mm -hmm. legacy island cloud specifically, okay. um, and physically in customer on customer premises. So you've got a uh, uh, client comes to you, let's say you're getting the whole, you're getting everything, or maybe you get some pieces of it, right? But ultimately you start talking about connectivity. How do you connect to the cloud? How do you connect to the internet? So you're going to deliver circuits to their offices. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do put the firewall there, and you're going to put the EDR on their desktops, and you're going to give them an MDR service here with, with your SOC. Um, oh, oh, what about switches and access points? I mean, is the client providing that themselves and responsible for it? Or are you guys deploying or helping them deploy? I mean, in this case, I would assume, you know, for switches and, and APs. Yeah, so we, we don't get into the management of those types of devices mm -hmm. today, at least. Um, I won't speak for the future because you never know. Um, what I will say is that um, we can we can resell that hardware. We can do um, kind of bespoke professional services to get those implemented, get them in place, that kind of thing. Um, we generally don't do bespoke managed services around that kind of thing, though if the right customer comes along, that's everything's possible type of situation. Um, what we do do is we we tend to work very closely with partners. Um, so we've we've got a mixed direct and channel type of a model that, that we utilized, very heavily tilted towards the channel side of things. So we work with a lot of managed service providers that that's what they do. So we've generally shied away from offering those services ourselves just because we do, you know, it's it's an interesting tightrope to walk. Sure. And I mean, you get the you get the point where it's like, we're going to do everything for you, but we're not going to do these things. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, so we, you you still need a switch and 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 Wi-Fi access points, but we don't do that. But we'll do the firewall. But then the switches and the Wi-Fi access points have to connect to the firewall. And then if you're actually trying to do, you know, any sort of, uh, I mean, I wouldn't call Fortinet segmentation, but if you're doing like VLAN separation and then um, policy enforcement and and traffic um, inspection through the firewall through VLANs, right? So you guys have to own that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is this all singularly managed? By eleven eleven, is the is it co managed with the client? Do they they have access to log in and make firewall policy changes? I mean, is that an allowed allowed thing? Yeah, at this point, we we fully manage, so we okay. more or less cut the customer off from managing it. Uh, we'll provide them read only access, so they can they can have full visibility into what's going on there. But we want to make sure that this is a, a well defined. You know, there's not two people pulling threads at the same time to potentially undo the entire sweater, um, so we can be very very cognizant of that security management side of things. And risk scanning, I mean, is this uh, like your, uh, what are the platforms, Rapid7, Tenable, Qualys? I mean, are you talking about vulnerability scanning and patch management where, you know, something's actually either installed as an agent or scanning IP addresses? Or is this a, just an external, hey, you've got a port open uh, and you're, you should know about it? Uh, both and. Okay. So, this this is a part. This is probably the part that gets me the most excited uh, with the continuous risk scanning piece. Um, Nerd. This yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, this is one of the exceptions. So this is not a Fortinet based product. Um, it's okay. it's using um, a tool um, made by Code Intelligence. Um, they're a pretty pretty small firm. Um, in given our size and their size, we we work very very collaboratively with them. In fact, I'm working on a project right now where they're developing some. Um, reports out of their own system to help us with with pre-sales of of mm -hmm. this tool, and so what the what this tool does is um, it, it can scan externally. You just point it at an IP range um, using using our scanners that that eleven eleven runs within our data centers. Um, customers can deploy the scanner internally so that they can do internal scanning. Again, that's that external interface to the individual systems to see ports open that kind of thing. Um, as well as being able to run agents on individual machines to get even more insight into that. And what it does is it, it does your traditional vulnerability scanning type stuff and, and patch management. And, you know, here's all your vulnerabilities and, and here's how you can patch them. And here's the CVEs and here's the, the CVE score. 
what Coda and, and what we offer through CRS on top of that is actually risk management. So being able to say, working with customers part of the deployment, what we do is we go through their environment. We say, you know, what is this system? What does it do? How important is it to your business? Is it exposed to the internet? Is it not exposed to the internet? How many firewalls? How protected is this system? Mm -hmm. To truly understand what the risk of a given vulnerability will be on a given system. So take, for example, there's there's been an unfortunate rash of VMware vulnerabilities that have been in the nine plus range. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I see that look and I feel it. Um, yeah. But you know what? A lot of those vulnerabilities, if if they had been implemented properly in the environment, putting them on an admin network, putting them behind extra firewalls, putting them in a place where very few people can get to them, you know, even going as far as air gapping them so that the only way to get to them is to go through a jump host. If those proper um, remediation efforts were already in place like they should be, and I don't fault anyone for not doing it because I've been there, I know how hard should be, oh, can oh, be. I'm going I'm to fall people publicly connecting their VMware hosts <laughs> to the internet. I'm, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, just, that... Yeah, that, that's you, like, let's put RDP on the internet. Don't, you, don't do that. You, you deserve the pain. Yeah. I mean, at some point, I'm. it's just, well, yeah. you know. But it, it, it goes deeper than that, obviously. Um, the more the more protected that can be, the better. So a CVE score of 10, to, to make it the worst case scenario, unfortunately, has happened with VMware recently, is, is a big deal. And if you're just doing vulnerability scanning for that and saying, hey, you've got a CVE of 10, go fix it right now. D drop everything and go do it. Yeah. Isn't truly identifying what your risk is with that. Because if you've got a, a a low CVE score exposed to the internet that is actively being exploited in the wild, you want to go fix that first. That is far riskier because when when you get into the security space and when you talk about getting um, getting invaded by by a cyber criminal, they don't need a very big toehole. They they're expert rock climbers. They they don't you may look at that toehole and say that's not a very good toehole, but it's enough for them oftentimes. So is the risk scoring something that is done on a host by host basis or is it done, you know, in your example when I think of like composite vulnerability scorings of like, you know, uh this CVE is terrible, but in order to exploit it you have to have admin access to the box in the first place, so it has a low risk mm -hmm. or you know, this is a relatively low CVE score, but it's actively exploited. So therefore you should probably do something about it pretty quickly. You know, I, I, I change, um, going through log4j drastically changed how I look at vulnerability yeah. scanning and risk management with that. And just, I mean, log4j, it just turns out was installed in everything, like yep. literally was installed in everything. And, uh, and then of course, I mean, what did we go through? We went through like, four or five version cycles where, you know, you, you thought you'd just like, okay, everything got revved. And then it was like, nope, that one's vulnerable too. Nope, yeah. that one's vulnerable too. Ratchet up the CV a little bit more, just a little oh, bit more, just a little a, bit more. Such a painful experience. Yeah. yeah so we, we definitely do take all that into account. Um, you know, again, working heavily with the customer to understand their environment so that we can mm -hmm. put any given vulnerability on any given system into the proper context of the environment as a whole to be able to um, understand the the threat intelligence aspect of things, what's actively being exploited. Because when, when you look at the number of vulnerabilities, and, and I'll speak more to 2021 because I know that data better because 22 is still not entirely um, been, been considered at this point. But when you look at 2021, the number of vulnerabilities was insane. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of new vulnerabilities identified in, in 12 months. But when you start looking at them as to, you know, how many of them were um, potentially exploitable, that number cuts down considerably. When you consider how many actively were exploited in the wild, cuts it down considerably more. Now, all of a sudden, you're down to maybe 10% of them that you need to worry about. And guess what? You don't have half of those applications that were vulnerable. So now you've cut that down even further. Mm -hmm. So now you know what you need to focus on, but which ones are most likely to, to get hit. And that's that's where risk separates from just simple vulnerability management and understanding, okay, if you go in and, and this is what CRS can then provide in the end is open up a dashboard and a customer can see, okay, here's my current environment. I've got this number of vulnerabilities, this number of, of remediations to do, this number of systems that are vulnerable, but here are the top 100, top five, top 10, whatever, whatever they want to see there. And we'll actually put together kind of an executive summary of if you do these things, 
you're going to spend roughly X number of man hours to, to resolve them. And you'll end up changing your total risk profile from 99 to 47. Are you, are you doing endpoint incident response with your clients or is this a, Hey, there's something going on. You should deal with it. You know, kind yeah. of pro- uh, you know, the, 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 I'm, I'm looking really specifically as for like where the line, what the, re- you know, what the, where the lines between who's responsible for what, you know, mm-hmm. breaks down. No, and that's that's super important that customers understand as they investigate security vendors is who's watching, who's acting, that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's where I like this slide because it kind of shows what's passive, what's active. So you know, from a CRS, from a SIM piece of things, that's just really looking at data. It's 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 gathering the data, but it's not really um, doing any sort of action. It, it may be recommending things, it may be highlighting trends, it may be highlighting potential situations. But then you need to flip over to now we're talking firewall, we're talking the, the EDR side of things, which is the let's actively defend. Um, mm-hmm. Let's do something about what's going on. Um, so the firewall obviously is is going to try to block things um, in, in a very shield type of type of manner. Um, we can tie in, you know, being fully managed, if something on un- uncouth is happening in the environment and we can see, oh, there's there's command and control stuff moving on. We can see that in the sim because we're collecting your logs. Now we can go into your firewall and shut that down so that that vulnerability or that um, that active exploitation can can be hopefully shut down at that point. Aggregating all of your security information into a sim is fantastic because mm-hmm. then you have a you know correlation, you know, and and um, and, re, you know, uh, a source of truth, let's just say. Now, what what I'm always looking for with these things is, um, you know, taking that next step, right? So, you know, is this just, hey, we're, we're logging data into the SIM? Are, you know, are you feeding threat intelligence into the SIM? You know, who are you feeding threat intelligence into the SIM with? How sophisticated has your, you know, uh, your, your SOC process gotten with your SIM in terms of... Um, you know, unusual traffic detection or unusual activity detection, right? You know, I'll use a good example of like, hey, this user has never accessed this application from China ever before in the history of this user being an employee slash this application being on the internet. Like, you know, some people have manufacturing and and employees and team in China and some people don't. So how, how smart is this platform for your clients? Yeah, so... Again, the sim, the sim is the center of the universe for that kind of stuff. Um, we do have for our SOC a, a SOAR implementation that helps to, to automate, coordinate all these different pieces together. Um, so that's kind of our, our core platform for all this. Um, working with customers when we onboard them, we spend a lot of time, again, understanding their environment. It doesn't matter which of these tools we're talking about. We spend a lot of time discussing their environment. What are what are the right behaviors? What are wrong behaviors? We bring a lot of experience with our SOC. We've got about a dozen analysts working between um, two locations in the U.S. And, and in the U.K. as well. So we bring a breadth of experience. A lot of that's coded into the platform to begin with, and, and we go in with a lot of defaults for customers and then work through those defaults. Hey, is this, is this valid for you? Should I tune it up? Should I tune it down? The idea really being with with the sim piece of things is to be able to not only do that correlation, but to cut down on the noise to really understand things like like you mentioned is that, hey, we have employees that generally are never going to talk to anything in China, and we should probably flag that with some exceptions. And then relying on our analysts to then review those alerts before shipping those off to the customer and letting them know, hey, there's a there's a situation happening. Um, at that point, the the EDR and the firewall play into to helping to defend and stop things. The EDR is is really more of the um, endpoint automation, shut down processes, shut down um, any any network traffic that it sees that is um, inappropriate, or that we alert it through through the SOAR implementation from SIM into that into that system. Um, but when it comes to, hey, something has broken out, that that machine has been locked with with BitLocker, whatnot, we don't get involved with the direct um, the direct interaction of of that um, incident response. Um, we again, this is a very fast moving environment. And what we found is that um, one, 
we're not staffed to do it that way. That takes a very specific type of staffing, a very specific approach to things that we don't have internally. Um, historically, we've relied on third parties to 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 be um, they they can jump in quick and help out with those things with customers. We believe pretty heavily in in a segregation of duty in that space too. Like if we're defending. We, we maybe shouldn't be getting involved with the response and, and especially once we start getting to the digital forensics side of things to make sure we're not, not protecting maybe a ourselves. Specific, maybe let me, let me ask a specific question here. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, best case scenario, you know, uh, something happens and, um, um, you notice traffic the sock notices traffic is, you know, there's there's a traffic abnormality, right? Mm-hmm. My example earlier of all of a sudden something is connecting to an application from a place it shouldn't be connecting from, or it's never connected in the past. You know, at this point, are are you is your sock team going to take proactive, you know, intervention measures, or is this a, you know, notification yeah. customer? This is going on. This is unusual. We think this isn't right. Yep. Like what's 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 that depends on the agreement that we that we built during onboarding with the customer mm-hmm. um, but generally any actions we're going to take directly to stop things are going to be through the EDR and the firewall pieces so we may have an agreement that they say if you see anything that isn't right go ahead and execute on it and then let us know so we may institute firewall rules we may you know tell the whole EDR environment to shut down this particular executable if it sees it um, other customers be maybe more of the we don't want to shut things down without talking about it first, and at that point we'll notify them and start a conversation around that. So depends on what the customer wants in that regard. Anything b- beyond what the firewall and the EDR are are there for to do is is not going to be on us. We're going to be in an advisory role. We're going to come in and we're going to say we notice this thing, and and kind of guide them, but rely on them to do the execution within their own environment. I mean, so there's scenarios I can imagine where clients are coming to you for backup or cloud or maybe even connectivity that wouldn't take security. Are you selling security standalone from your cloud and connectivity Mm -hmm. products as well? Absolutely. And then, you know, uh, next question, I mean, just thinking about, you know, your underlying vendor platforms here or stack, it would be, uh, you know, when do you move into, I mean, I'm going to use big air quotes, a full sassy offering. Yeah. (laughs) And, and I'll, I'll actually be a little more specific with this, um, in the sense of if you're putting, you know, the FortiGates do a decent job at, you know, most of the SD-WAN function for a client, mm-hmm. um, you know, most of it, right. There's, there's cases where they don't, but, um, you know, the, the next piece would be for, you know, your work from home, your remote users that are not behind a physical firewall at a premise. You know, do you are you are you offering that you know web gateway product um, and managing that for companies as well? Yeah. So today we're we're offering that full SD WAN solution with with the FortiGates. Mm-hmm. Um, so FortiGate is an interesting product for us because it can be a security product, it could be a cloud product, it could be a connectivity product, um, it could be all three at the same yeah. time. So. You know, we we do offer the full. Hey, you want an SD WAN solution to to connect users into the cloud and the on-premises solutions, we can build that, um, including the the last mile, the the, the broadband type solutions, that all, all those pieces. Um, so we can bring a complete solution for that, yes. Um, some of the other products um, like Web Application Gateway are, are kind of on our roadmap. Uh, we don't have them today. And it's a bit of understanding what customers are looking for. And you know we're beginning of the year, so we're really taking a hard look at the roadmap and what we're going to approach for the year. Um, you know, as, as we talk here at the beginning of 2023. I, the conversation I'm having right now is this, this, um, I mean, you talk to an IT team and you're like, you know, they're reopening offices and there's a push mm-hmm. to reopen and to have a, you know, a return to office. But then you say, you know, what percentage of your workforce is going to be in your office and what percentage is going to be remote on any, any given day. And the, the, you know, the response is just like, I have, you know, like whatever, <laughs> you know, like just yep. like the hands just go up in the air and, and, and really, you know, I'm not going to make a forecast on like office versus not office, but it really does feel like the normal going forward is this expectation of a significant percentage of, you know, of employee access from not a traditional office setting as a, as a permanent requirement 
Yep. And, you know, having uh, secure internet access and secure, you know, I mean, I'm trying not to use different trade names for these things, but, you know, secure web gateway and the ZTNA type functionality that can be extended outside of the office. Um, you know, it, it, there's like two more dots here on your, on your, on your slide you need to plug in. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's definitely more to be built. No doubt about that. Um, like I said, the security space is moving very, very fast and, you know, being a security specialist really makes you a generalist these days because yeah. there are so many, so many sub aspects of it. Um, and your SOC is separate from your data center and cloud knock operations. This is a dedicated function. Correct. Yep. And then uh, you said it was in the U.S. and then the U.K. Correct. Yep. We've okay. got two locations in the U.S. and one in the U.K. Okay. How how big is your SOC? Like, what's your staffing depth? Yeah, we're we're about a dozen right now. I don't okay. I don't know, and I'm not sure if I can even share the exact number at that point. Sure. Um, but highly experienced people. Um, you know, we've got four or five different tiers of of analysts um, involved in there, including people that are more focused on the automation aspect of things with our SOAR and making sure that the the data is in the analyst's hands when and where they need it. Um, so let's talk about your cloud services. And yeah. This is and your and backup and DR and um, VMware and everything else that fits into this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. Um, again, pretty heavily leveraged on what Island offered previously with with some plugins from the other other organizations that we've acquired. Um, and again, not including the SunGuard stuff at this point. We're we're just now starting to figure out what pieces are going to plug together. So, as you mentioned, um, backup as a service, DR as a service are two of the big things. Um, our backup as a service is not only backing up virtual machines that customers have running on premises, um, but also some some capabilities and we've got some um some roadmap to build it out further to to back up from the hyperscalers for clarity yeah define the difference between backup as a service and dr as a service oh, okay good good point um so backup as a service being um you know backing up virtual machines is is really what it kind of comes down to or backing up microsoft 365 from a SaaS perspective dr as a service is is similar but different and to me, it's really important that customers understand the difference there because DR as a service is about re restoring functionality as quickly as possible and, and with as little loss as possible. So the classic example is with backups, you're talking generally 24 hours of um, recovery point objective. You know, when you re restore it, you're going to lose most likely about up to 24 hours, potentially more. With DR as a service, we're talking much narrower time frame frames and much faster restorability. So with 11.11, when we go to market with Baz and Draz, we're, we're talking with customers and really trying to understand what their business needs are for, for recovery and then creating a solution based on that using those two tools. And the two work very well together. Um, one doesn't replace the other by any stretch of the imagination because um, with backup as a service, we're not focused on being able to recover those backups quickly. That's what DR is for. It's DRs that push a button and things start restoring automatically because you've predefined what needs to start, when it needs to start. You just, as part of pushing the button, need to choose, you know, what time frame, what point in time do you want to recover to? Whereas backup is more designed for, I need individual files, I need an individual VM, and that restoration could be to our cloud, it could be to on-premises, it's built in a way that it's um, convenient for both but not necessarily ever going to be as fast as, as DR is going to be. And you're huge Veeam and Zerto partners. How much of this is, is this a product selection where you go through this evaluation and it's like, oh, we want backup or we want DR and that drives you to Veeam or Zerto? Or is it, you just, it's, this is client preference. You know, they, they know and like or already have one. And that's, you know, drives the, okay, great. You know, you've chosen you know, a DRAS pro, you know, service, but uh, you like Veeam, so you use Veeam, or you've chosen Baz and you like Zerto, so you use Zerto. Yeah, it's it's as any technology decision, it's it's a lot of all of that. Um, so spend a lot of time. We we have a fantastic SA team. They they blow me away constantly. Having been an SA in the past, um, I, I'm super impressed with with the team that we have. They'll sit down with customers and understand what their business needs are, and, and really those needs have to really should be defined at the business level. If you're coming in as an IT person talking to somebody about DR and you haven't talked to the business about what they need, you're, you're going to fail. I, 
it's sooner or later you're gonna fail. You may complete the project successfully and create something, mm -hmm. but if you ever have to do that failover, it's not gonna go pretty. Um, I've been down that road so many times, I don't hesitate to say that out loud on, on the record. <laughs> um, so working with, with those customers to understand those needs is, is really the goal. And ideally to, to take whatever tools we have and put them together to create that customer need. Um, rarely ever do we do both um, Veeam-based DR and Zerto-based DR just because it, it it's too much. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. You lose a lot of the benefit of push a button to restore type functionality there. Mm -hmm. Though there is theoretically a use case with a large enterprise customer. Um, so working with them, of course, they'll take into account, hey, we already have a thorough Veeam implementation. Cool. Well, as long as you don't need a very specific thing that, that Zerto provides, then we're, we'll, we're good. We can, we can go forward with that. If they already have Zerto in place and they want to, to use that going forward, they just want to swing their, um, their, their DR location from you know, maybe a secondary on-premises data center to, to Island's data center, to 11.11's data center. There, I, I made that mistake finally. Um, we can do that. Um, of course, those, those go into business requirements and understanding what the right solution is for the customer. So the answer to your question ultimately is yes to everything. Um, and it's, it's really trying to figure out the right balance for the customer, both in the, in the short term and the long term there. And this was, I mean, you know, this was a, an amazingly well-kept secret for iLand, both in the BAS and the DRAS options, but then the next part of it, which is, you know, being able to predefine a uh, application environment in your VMware vCloud, but not pay for consumption of that until you needed to hydrate those VMs. I love that term, hydrate the VM. <laughs> came up with it. It's just so it's good. good visual. Yeah, I know, right? It's just, it's so, it's so good. Um, makes me laugh every time I say it too. Uh, <laughs> you know, but to hydrate the VMs and, and to actually recover. And, and um, yeah, you know, let's, let's, I think you should talk about that a little bit because yeah. it's been a while for me and it's, I think, a, a pretty big core component here of yeah of what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our, our DR as a service environment is really built on a platform we built for IS. So it is, a, it is a full infrastructure as a service based on VMware, based on VMware vCloud. So, you know, a big part of the solution there is that it's pretty rare we come across a customer, though we do definitely run into Hyper-V and Nutanix customers, but um, we are a VMware-based cloud because most customers are running VMware on-premises. And when they want to mm -hmm. fail over, the last thing we want to deal with is a conversion of VMs. I'm, I'm a very firm believer in that. I'm not a big fan of restoring to AWS and Azure because guaranteed you're going to have to not only um, change that VM into something else, but they've got a very different model of what a VM is than what even Hyper-V and Nutanix have from what VMware has. So I'm a really big fan of Island before I was working here um, as, as a person that likes to look at the industry and what all is going on because of that fact. So that IaaS platform is, we have customers that run production infrastructure on that um, infrastructure. And that could be public cloud where, you know, Coke and Pepsi are sharing the same set of hosts. It can be private cloud infrastructure where it is all orchestrated by vCloud Director and, and provided through um, our custom-built console so that they can manage those VMs in that way, but know that they've got their own hardware stack with which to, to run on. Or we could do it as, um, as kind of a bare metal as a service type of solution where we provide um, all the core components to the customer and then they lay down Windows, Linux, ESXi, whatever they want on top of that to, to be able to manage their own environment. Um, each one implies different levels of access to the underlying infrastructure. Obviously, with public cloud, you're going to get very little access. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get at best, you're going to get vCloud Director access. Um, you're never going to touch below that. So, again, looking at customer needs around that, um, and, and that whole platform is is essentially duplicated for our DR as a service. So, when customers fail over. You know, we never know. Are they going to need a failover for an hour? Are they going to need a failover for a day? Are they failover forever? And we definitely have had customers that fail over to us. They're like, okay, we, we didn't really trust cloud with our production, but we were forced to. And hey, it actually works really, really great. We like this. And we just simply flip that over into our IaaS environment and they just keep on marching their merry way. 
or the other side of it, which is you fail over and you start running and then you start trying to figure out how to fail back. And you're like, ah, that's a pretty big yeah. pain, you know, and, and, uh, let's just not, which. Yeah, that definitely I'm happens. Saying. What is lab? So lab, this, this is, this is the one that gets me excited on, on the cloud slide more than anything else is uh, lab engine is the product there. So lab engine is again, built on top of that same platform in our IaaS scenario. But what it does is it, it layers on um, a level on top of that that provides an environment for our, for our customers to be able to create their own um, dynamic lab environments. So they can create a core identity of what's, what a lab environment would look like and then share that out with um, employees, customers, prospects, whoever. Um, heavily used like in training type environments. Uh, if you've ever been to... Um, Zertocon or uh, Vimon, you've used Lab Engine. Um, they both utilize this Lab Engine product to do their hands-on labs and to be able to give you know attendees that ability to actually create a whole environment. You know, here's here's your primary site with a couple of servers and a and a Veeam server, and over here is a DR environment that is you know has has the internet between the two of them. Logically speaking, of course that has a couple of hosts and now you can fail those virtual machines over in a completely self-contained lab environment. And when that, when that, um, that hands-on lab is completed and the user walks away, the whole thing gets destroyed and a new one gets spun up for the next user. Um, so very, very cool technology. Um, that's actually been around for a very long time and is very much a hidden gem within the, the 1111 portfolio. So I love talking about that one because it, it, it is a fairly narrow use case, but there's very few solutions in that particular space. And, and it can be a lot of effort to build that environment um, from scratch. You said something about bare metal with IaaS, but you also offer co-location. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a, a global footprint offer or select markets, um, you know, and, and I mean, why would somebody colo with you versus an IaaS versus colo with, you know, a, a different building, right? Yeah. So our, our uh, co-location is, is really to help with customers who have varied needs, if you will. Um, so we're not going out there in a Phoenix nap type model where it's like, Hey, you could, you could, you could buy a, U, you could buy a rack, you could buy a cage, you could buy a room. Um, we're not offering it at that level anymore that's that's been a product that we've kind of phased out over time and is really focused today on hey I want to move my production to to the cloud I've got 90 virtual machines I want to move them out to the cloud but I've got this one this one machine that is connected to our i series or connected to some other sort of legacy type of device <sighs> um, not that legacy devices are bad <laughs> or shouldn't be in your environment today because they they very much serve a role, but those environments that can't be virtualized. Um, it's really designed to help enable those types of use cases. Customers that want to bring a very specific hardware firewall or some other network type device, um, we, we provide that capability in not all of our data centers, but most of our data centers to be able to to rack up their, their own physical equipment so that they can connect it in with the cloud solution because we, we're not going to claim that everybody should be 100% cloud. SunGuard had a, I mean, you just triggered something for me here, which is, so SunGuard had a very specific service offering around AS400 hosting mm -hmm. and management. Is that something that you've acquired and are continuing with? I mean, yep. this is a, it's a, it's a very, it's a, that's a niche, right? Yeah, it, it is very much a niche, but it's very much a, if you can't s scratch that particular niche, to make a really bad pun, um, you don't have a chance at, at working with that customer because they need that. Um, yeah. I, I worked at an insurance company. I know how important a mainframe can be to the core business. Oh, they're never going away. <laughs> I mean, these things. I, I know just... of a few that have managed to eliminate them out of their environments, but it is by no means an easy project. And they're usually at, at least, you know, we're talking decade scale in some of those yeah. cases. So um, I, who's, I mean, who's, who's a good customer? for 11 11 at this point I, you know i and i'm oh, wow. let me let me put this in a few different kind of contexts right you know we can I'm, I'm curious you know how you would view that from a you know like services mix 
But I'm also interested in terms of like a sizing, you know, mm -hmm. and like we, where you guys are like focused and optimized on, like, you know, where, where do you really like, what becomes like your bread and butter, like your sweet spot? Like everybody will be like, oh, you know, we can scale all the way down to here and we can yeah. scale all the way up to there. But like, where's, where's the place where like, you know, if, if you walked into a meeting and started going through like a, a discovery workshop you know, and they start checking boxes. It's just like, oh, this is a no brainer. You know, yeah. we're going to knock this out of the park today. Um, again, kind of leaving the sun guard piece to the side, given the fact that it hasn't been fully integrated with everything. Um, and, and gaining tools like a native AS 400 DR type type solutions that they offer. Um, they have much more niche products in that mm -hmm. space than, than the, you know, legacy Island and GCD pieces today. We're, we're, Really more focused on the mid market piece of things. Um, you know, we can we can scale fairly small, but of course, there's always a um, initial investment that has to happen with with any solution. Um, so I'm not going to claim that you know a, a random mom and pop that has 10 VMs that we're going to be right solution. Um, we would generally point them to an MSP that may be using us on the back end, and they get that that level of scale across multiple customers. Um, again, why we why we come with such a heavy channel focus in that regard. Um, on the enterprise side of things, we definitely have enterprise customers. We have some very large um, organizations that that we have as customers. Some of which I could name names, and you would know. Some of which I can't. Um, and you know, even some of the big names don't have a lot with us. They may just be doing backup, for example. Um, but you know, we were thoughtful about those types of customers that could we support them in an IaaS model if they decided to move production over. Um, so one of the bigger names that, that I know is, is out there and we have, um, actually have case studies on is like Lush, the cosmetics bath mm -hmm. and body, um, store. I, I know that one well, cause my wife is a big fan. Um, and I use their products as well. I won't lie. Um, so, you know, we, we can, we can scale to enterprise. They aren't the use cases we necessarily focus on um, because there are a lot of challenges there. Um, you know, they can be highly demanding. They can be um, more expensive to have as a customer. So it, it's not that we can't support them. It's just that we we have to be mindful about the the bottom line on things and, and making sure that one large customer doesn't disrupt all the other customers. Um, well, a layer on top of that is SunGuard comes in. Part of, part of the attraction with SunGuard to 1111 was their enterprise focus. And mm -hmm. what they've been able to do with enterprises and, and be able to support them in a successful manner. So we're, again, going going through that process, understanding what pieces and parts are key to that so that we can start integrating them together into a, into a single solution there. So when you say mid-market, are you talking, you know, uh, look like employee count, uh, you know, so a head count, uh, revenue counts, you know, so, so I think mid-market, I think, um, I mean, everybody defines us differently, right? Yes, some exactly. say like 500 to 5,000, some, you know, I mean, th those numbers go up and down pretty, pretty significantly. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't, um, focus too much on defining that space. Um, you know, within the sales team, it's, it's less about, oh, this, this customer has less than 500 employees. We're not going to deal with them. Or this customer only brings in you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year. We're not going to focus on them. Um, it, it's really more about what their IT is like. You know, mm -hmm. number of virtual machines I talked about before. Um, you know, the complexity of their environment plays very heavily into there because you can have a, a company of fifty people have very complex environments and need a, a complex solution in order to solve their needs. Uh, so it's less about the, the 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 total revenue or the number of employees or the number of offices. And, and more about what kind of solution they need. So we generally will take a call with, with anybody who's interested in the solutions that we offer and work through, hey, is this, is this the proper fit in the first place? Or should we, should we, should we give it to one of our MSPs to manage because it's, it's a little bit more high touch than we're used to, even though it's a smaller environment. Um, so there's, there's a lot of decisions that go in around that. Uh, we talked about ISO certification earlier. Um, but you know, along this line, you know, you get into lots of others, manufacturing, CMMC, you know, FedRAMP, ITAR, PCI, HIPAA, high trust. Um, are you playing in those spaces? I mean, do you have, uh, if you know, if you have a, you know, I mean, so what would be the example, right? Like, uh, 
SEC regulated, banking regulated, uh, defense contractor, you know, healthcare, you know, how, how deep does your compliance bench go for these kind of organizations? Yeah, um, goes very deep. The legacy island piece of things that, again, the 1111 cloud platform is primarily based on was very focused on security and compliance. So had a lot of features built in that, that other VMware cloud providers weren't, weren't providing. Um, things like we had vulnerability scanning built in. Customers didn't have to pay for it. They had a simple report that they could they could get once a week or they could run on demand. Um, we have Trend Micro built into the platform. Customers can simply just load, load it into their VMs and, and be able to, to have that protection built into the platform. So focus a lot on that, uh, particularly over the last five to eight years to build that in there. Pretty solid core now. Um, having more robust managed security products in, in the portfolio where we're slowly shifting things underneath to be more in line with what we offer to our own customers, eating our own dog food type of thing, if you will. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, along with that came compliance. So we've, we've been very focused on compliance, making sure that customers can feel assured that, you know, if you're, if you're covered by GDPR, if you're covered by ITAR, if you're covered by high trust um, are all ones that, that we, we definitely talk about, you know, talked about ISO and, and making sure that customers can trust our processes, that we're following them, that, that they can understand what's going on there. Um, and, and then built into our console, being able to provide reporting on all of that so customers can very easily access that for their own needs. Um, if it comes to the point where they need to talk to somebody, we have a dedicated compliance team that is available as to customers, both pre-sales and post-sales um, for certain amount of time depending on what they what they need there so if they get into an audit and they're like uh we're we're, we're really relying on 1111 for this here's their report the the auditor comes back with a few questions they can then contact our our internal compliance team who my goodness i Compliance is one of those areas a lot of us technologists are like, I don't want anything to do with that. Give me a specialist to work with that. I've never worked with a better team. Um, and, and in fact, um, you can go back and, and I do I do a podcast as well for, um, for, for 1111. It goes back to the island days. Not focus on our technologies, but focus more on the market. Mm-hmm. And on one of those episodes where we talked about compliance, I had um, the person that was leading our compliance at the time on and it was just so exciting talking to her because she loves compliance. She loves talking about it. She loves everything about it. And I'm like, this is the kind of excitement I need on these places to make me interested in it. And so working with them is, is actually a a pleasure both internally and and customers rave about them as well. They're, they're consistently one of our higher rated departments in the company. Every, everybody going through a sock audit right now, I'm sure is very excited about compliance. Yes. Uh, you know, there's another icon here I should ask you about. Mm-hmm. Uh, secure Cloud Backup for Microsoft 365. Yep. Um, so I think the conversation starter should be something along the lines of, wait a minute, it's in Microsoft's cloud. Mm-hmm. Doesn't Microsoft protect me? The answer to that is sort of. <laughs> um, just like any other place where you've got data. You need to define the level of importance to that data, the rate of change to that data, how often you need to protect it, how long you need to protect it. Compliance comes into play. It's it's complex. It's it's not easy, um, which is why we have focused on that as as kind of our first SaaS offering. We we're constantly evaluating other options and, and what to do there. So the thing I, I'd like to um, use to demonstrate the importance of that is that hey. When you were running Exchange on premises, you had it backed up on a regular basis, right? At least every 24 hours, and you're keeping them off site, and you're keeping them for, yeah, so on and so forth. Priv- if you ever had, if you ever run Exchange and you had a <laughs> information store correction, priv.edb, right? Like if for that ever went on you, you really wanted, oh god, yes, yes, backups, backups are important. Attack here. Yeah, backups are no less important when you put them into a SaaS provider or cloud, any, any sort of cloud provider. In this case, of course, we're talking SaaS. So does Microsoft protect it? Yeah, they're, they're going to give you resiliency. They're going to give you redundancy. They're not necessarily going to give you those for the data itself. That's more for the services. Um, also, you know, one of the reasons, I mean, you didn't rely just on replicating your exchange data. You, you relied on backups that were taken out of one system and put into another system. And that's a key part of that um, three to one concept of backup. 
um, which we all subscribe to for the most part at this point in our data centers. But for some reason, we're like, eh, throw all that experience away when we move to the cloud. No, um, you know, we've got baked into our IaaS platform backup so that customers can move their data from one data center to another. And, and we segregate our data centers in a way that customers can, can view that as a complete separation at that point. If one data center goes down completely, if our console goes down, they still have access to that data through um, the Veeam Explorer, through, through native Veeam tools. They can still access all that information. So being able to access that data when the main thing burns to the ground is, is one of the primary purposes of backup. And anybody who's dealt with any cloud platform knows that they're never always available. Bad things happen. Um, you know, employees and bad actors can accidentally or purposely delete data and it can go unnoticed until it rolls off, you know, the, the, the backup schedule. Again, if that's a very short, if it's just a recycle bin and you've got 30 days to restore it from the recycle bin, that's great if you notice it in 30 days. If you don't notice it in 30 days, you're really hopeful that there's there's a backup somewhere that has that. So so actually, this is kind of relevant. We were talked about, you mentioned BitLocker earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, 2022 stats, um, decreases dwell time pretty significantly. Yes. You know, so now I think we're, I mean, I, I saw this, I saw dwell time as high as like 200 and some odd days. And I, the average dwell time now is about three weeks, 20 days, 22 days. But this brings into a, an interesting question when you start talking about, you know, ransomware specifically as an attack. Um, and as a, as a ev- incident event for, a, for a company, how do you validate and decide and determine a restore point after a ransomware attack? Like, you know, how are you guys helping clients with this? Right. So, I mean, you know, I, I mean, and, and we could use Baz or, or Draz, you know, as uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I don't care, you know, we don't get too technical or too specific, but um, I, I think this piece is missing from a lot of the conversation around ransomware and security mm-hmm. is the backup side of it. And then of course the, you know, like what do you actually do when this happens to you? Yeah, so that that is definitely a conversation we have with customers is they're defining what they need from us in these spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the nice things with the 365 backup specifically is that is unlimited retention. So it's a dual edged sword. Definitely, but um, customers can keep their data as long as as long as they want. Really, is what that means. Um, if they've got regulations or they've got um, valid situations where they just don't want to keep the data forever, they can they can tune that down. That that is an option. Um, but by default, it is it is unlimited retention, so you can go back as far as you need to. Um, with our backup as a service, it's it's a little bit more. You need to define what retention you want, and there there are cost implications to that. So working with customers to figure out how long do you need to keep your data? What regulations are, are you beholden to? You know, if you're, if you're a healthcare provider and you want to back up systems that have pediatric data, well, in the U.S. these days, you've got to keep that for potentially 18 years plus. So understanding those types of things, again, having a very strong compliance department that knows what they're doing very strongly, um, informing our, our, our field team so that they understand what those customer needs are in, in different verticals so that they can help drive that conversation um, and, and define what solution a customer needs for that. Now, when it comes to the restoration side of it, that's kind of on the customers at this point to, to figure out um, you know, what, what point in time is the right time for them to restore to. Um, that is definitely an area that um, in the product innovation team, we are considering very heavily what we can do to help customers in that space um, in a, you know, computerized automated type of fashion. Um, don't have anything to talk about today, but there's definitely definitely ideas floating around and, and product I expect that we'll, we'll release sometime in the future. I mean, the real world nightmare is, is okay, we've got ransomware, you know, go back to backup and you re- restore the backup and turn the machine back on and the backup had ransomware yep. on it. And then you're like, okay, go back farther. And then you're in this cycle of like, okay, how far back do we, you know, and, and is, you know, I, people don't talk about this. Like, nope. you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, retention strategies for backups, you know, it's normal to be like, okay, you know, we're going to have nightly, you know, like full nightlies and we're going to keep every, you know, weeklies for a period of time. We're to keep a, a monthly going back however span of time. But when you actually turn around and say, okay, like let's restore a backup from like three months ago. <laughs> 
there's a lot of change in a business yeah. in three months. Uh, you, you know, like, you know, I mean, that, that, uh, uh, that, I mean, it's great that you have it, but going back three months in time, you know, it's, it's like, it can be like going, like going, going back to the stone ages for some, but that, for some environment. That's also highly dependent on the system. I mean, my web server in a three tier environment, it may not change in three months. So sure. that may be okay. And we, we you know, we're, we've switched from dailies to weeklies to monthlies fairly quickly. But, you know, when we're talking about the database on the back end that, you know, all the dynamic parts of that website are in that database and that is changing on a minute by minute basis. Now, all of a sudden, maybe we're, maybe we're not doing every 24 hours backup. We're, we're taking a backup every, every hour and, you know, we'll have customers that say, okay, we're going to take a backup locally every hour and every eight hours, every 12 hours, we're going to ship that over to 11.11, put it on their cloud. So we've got that offsite storage taken care of. And then we're going to retain that, you know, every eight hour backup for, you know, a week, two weeks, depending on, depending on what they need. Like, like you said, keeping a, keeping a daily backup for a month may be completely worthless. Like having that level of granularity doesn't matter at that point. You've lost so much data, it may not make a difference. So save, yeah. save some money and not have to store that many. And again, this is company by company server by server decision that needs to be had. And, you know, we do a lot to, to help guide customers there. We don't, we don't prescribe, but we've got a lot of best practices. We've got a lot of experience to, to help customers with that. Cause you know, most customers and, and I've been there, I only know my environment. And that was part of the reason I decided to, to move from a customer to, a, to a VAR was I only see one environment when I work for the customer. I want to go see dozens and dozens of environments a year and, and see what other people are doing and, and bring that, that experience, that worldview from all of my customers into every customer individually. And so that's, that's a big part of, you know, being a service provider for us is to be able to bring that experience to customers. You know, it's, it's, so it's, uh, what is it? It's January 18th. Um, you know, crystal ball question. What does 2023 bring? <laughs> oh man, I've, I, I did a whole blog post and a whole pair oh, of webinars ready to go. on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, from a cloud perspective specifically, it's, you know, we've, we've seen a huge ramp up in the last three years uh, with, with cloud. And if you look at some of the polling um, that, that is done, you know, independently, a lot of surveys are, are finding that customers are starting to get to a, a stasis point, meaning they may have moved a ton of stuff into the cloud, but they're finding some stuff maybe shouldn't have been in the cloud or you know, works fine in the cloud for the use case they needed at the time, but decided that, hey, we, we can actually, we've got evidence on both sides. It's actually more effective to be on-premises. Or they found out that AWS is actually really expensive. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, repatriation due to cost is definitely a thing. Um, yeah, I see a lot of that. Yeah, and, you know, my advice with customers there is always, AWS is one business model amongst many for the cloud. Mm -hmm. So don't throw the cloud out with that, with that particular bathwater. Um, because there's, you know, we have a we have a very different model than the way AWS and Azure and, and GCP go to market because we saw the flaws in what they're doing and said, hey, there's there's a need to do it differently. Um, so you know, we have we have a very different model in which we we go to market. So um, you know, we've we've we have one customer that's huge, um, fairly common name in the IT space that they run their SaaS based on virtual machines in our, in our platform. Um, so if you're accessing their SaaS services, odds are you're hitting one of one of 1111's data centers as a virtual machine. And they're constantly asking, is this still the right model? Should we re-platform this particular thing to AWS Azure? Should we, should we rewrite it into a more cloud native type of a model? And, and they're finding that the effort to redo their code is actually more expensive than just running it in virtual machines, which is kind of counter to everybody's like, oh, you gotta you gotta be as granular as possible. If you're not using microservices, you're doing cloud wrong. <laughs> That's not true for oh. everybody. Oh, come on, let's not get into a microservices versus <laughs> monolith like argument right now. Yeah. Um, there's room for both. That's and, yeah. and just like we talked about, you know, there's still mainframes out there and there's still a reason there's mainframes out there. Well, you know, the original promise of the cloud was elasticity. And elasticity is great in certain requirements, but when you start talking about, especially mid-market mid -market enterprise, the amount of elasticity that is required in an IT system on a you know month over month or quarter over quarter basis 
it, it's just it doesn't exist. Yep. And um, and you know the thing that that I see a lot is once you get to you know you say sta- um, stasis once you get to your steady state. You know, at some point you get to a steady state, you launch an application, you acquire, you onboard clients, you get to a certain point where you're in a relatively predictable business based on client demand, growth, utilization, whatever it is, you know, getting to those steady state applications really, you know, uh, need to dictate like, okay, you know, are we doing what we should be doing here and how do we change this? And, uh, you know, I, I think that conversation's starting. I think, yeah, uh, definitely. I think people are starting to look at that a little bit closer. Yeah. I mean, from a marketing perspective, we talk a lot about moving from cloud first to cloud smart. And it's not about <laughs> everything needs to move to the cloud, get to the cloud as quick as possible. It's more about let's get the right stuff to the cloud in the right cloud. Um, you know, the multi cloud, hybrid cloud, whatever terminology you want to use there um, is a real thing and for real reasons because customers need specific things. Just like when we bought stuff for on premises 20 years ago. I can't remember the number of times I sat down and said, okay, let's do a product investigation, which is the right product. Okay, one advantage of this one is is that it's the same manufacturer as this other thing and they will highly integrate. But this other thing offers feature set that maybe we'll need in 10 years or five years. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should consider it because of the longevity side of things. This one's going to be cheaper. Do we want which 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 one is the most important to, to us as IT professionals, but also to the business in the long run? And of course, cloud is no different. Like, should I run Exchange in a virtual machine on somebody else's cert, on someone else's computer, um, or should I run it in 365? That's a pretty well-defined answer at this point. Like, very few organizations need to be running their own Exchange server anymore. Um, but that doesn't mean that your responsibility to the data changes. What's 1111's footprint geographically now? I mean, so where are your facilities and what regions? Um... Yeah. You know, obviously North America, United States, but mm-hmm. I mean, r- rattle it off for me. Yeah. Um, heavy pro- footprint in the U.S. Um, and I won't even claim to be able to conceptualize it all as, as we've grown so fast over the last year. Um, but, you know, we've got West Coast, we've got Central, we've got East Coast. Um, so we've got a bunch of different stuff in the U.S. Uh, we've got a data center in Toronto. Um, and then... Um, Overseas, we've got data. You've got a couple data centers in the UK. We've got one in mainland Europe. Uh, we've got one in Singapore and a couple in Australia. Okay. Um, and that, of course, is pre pre SunGuard. So SunGuard adds a whole bunch more. Yeah, in there SunGuard brings a, brings well. a big footprint on themselves. Yeah, and and from what we acquired is primarily in the US. But I mean, this, these things are also now getting important in terms of data jurisdiction. You know, yep. like there's lots of examples where you need to have your data resident in a jurisdiction that's applicable for what kind of business you're in or where you're conducting business or where you're in business or where your clients are in business or, or things like that. Yep. So um, locality still matters, both from application data, but also from regulation more and more so every day. OK, Brian, final words. What what uh, what didn't we talk about that we should touch on here? So we, yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's, of course, a lot more depth. Um, you know, we didn't talk a whole lot about connectivity as a standalone. Um, but to the point earlier, it is, it is a piece that is an enablement to all this other stuff. Um, we very much look at that as we, we can sell you a, a single line into your, into your office and, and be done with it and walk away from that at that point. Um, we can manage it. Um, but you know, tying all these things together, and more importantly, one big focus eleven eleven has across everything we've talked about ends up being you know managed services, managing these environments. And this is very acute in the security space right now, where um, I think the latest stat is that by I don't know twenty twenty six or something, half of the cybersecurity jobs will have people to fill them. In other words, we'll have twice as many jobs as we have people that are capable of actually doing the work. Yeah, that's that's scary. Um, we're we're already well um, well on our way there. Um, I think today's stat is something like only two thirds of the roles are filled, and of course that leads to those people are expensive. They're hard to retain. They're hard to find, mm-hmm. and so 
security is by no means the only place where that's happening. And so we're really focused on what are the places that customers are going to be challenged to do things on their own and helping them to plug those holes. So security is, is of course, a big, big part of that. Um, it, again, it isn't the most acute, the most obvious one, but we're seeing a really big uptick in, in the backup side of things. Like customers don't want to manage backups anymore. They see it as this technology has not changed much. Um, you know, on the periphery and the use cases have, have, you know, continued to change. And I'm not trying to say there's no innovation in, in the backup space because there most definitely is. But the concepts, the, the approach to managing it has become very, um, you don't differentiate your business by doing backups differently than the person next door. You know, Coke and Pepsi are probably backing up exactly the same way. And neither of them are gaining more business by doing it differently. So that gets to a point where it's like, okay, is it cheaper for us to have people dedicated to doing this um, or have people that are knowledgeable about it? You know, th and this goes small business to large business. Small business, mm -hmm. you've got one, two, three people that have to do everything. If they don't have to do backup on top of all the other things, that's a win. Um, especially if we can give it to somebody who's going to be 10 times better than that three people combined could ever be. And I don't say that to denigrate small business admins because they are freaking awesome. I would never want to do their job because I don't think I could conceptualize as much as they do on, on any given day. But on the enterprise side of things, they're dedicating teams to do nothing but backups. And, you know, people are expensive. Um, and, and if they can outsource that and make that managing that outsource one of many duties that they have, you know, that, that same person can also be the person that, that considers the DR side of things and, you know, data security. And maybe, maybe they're the, the, the storage administrator, you know, it could be one duty amongst many that doesn't require a specialized skill set. Let somebody who does it for hundreds of customers every day of the week do it because they're going to specialize in that. And so that's, that's a place that we're really focusing on is making sure that those places where customers don't want to deal with it, um, or we could do it a heck of a lot cheaper or more efficient or um, just, just frankly better. Again, not to denigrate any administrator, but I know that um, somebody focusing on security all day, every day is going to do it a lot better than somebody who's doing it 10% every day. When, when I started, the ratio of IT to employee to headcount was 60, 65 to one. So 60, 65 employees to every one person working in IT. And I have, I mean, there's uh, that ratio. I mean, it, it skews based on technology a little bit, but 160, 165 is kind of the average, 165 to one. I don't, there, there was a point in time where I think IT teams and IT, IT people were really, there could have been a resistance to going into managed services or cloud services or thinking, yep. you know, because they wanted to have control or this feeling of control over it. I don't know how much that exists in this world just because of the requirement of the job. I mean, you cannot have that much headcount you're responsible for and, you know, pretend like you have time to take tapes out of your autoloader and put them into a lockbox for, yep. you know, a company to come pick them up and take them offside for you. I mean, like, it's just, first off, do you even want to drive to the office in order to make that happen anymore? <laughs> you yeah. know, like, let's just be real. And the answer is probably no, right? Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think for a while there was a definitely a, there became this kind of like negative connotation, you know, server huggers and like all these different things yep. with like, uh, you know, control. And I don't, I don't, I, I don't see that. As, I don't perceive that so much anymore. Um, not in my experience, at least. I think now it's just, you know, it, it just really feels like it's just an overwhelming amount of work and responsibility. Yeah. And more, you know, how do you smartly to what you were just saying, like, how do you smartly scale yourself in a way that's efficient and, you know, um, and, and lever experts in different things? Yeah. Right? Yeah, very much so. And that's, that's what we hear from customers coming to us for those needs. So for example, we're, we're having customers asking us to manage not only their cloud-based backups, but also their on-premises backups. They don't, they love Veeam, they love whatever product they're using, but they're like, we don't want to deal with it anymore. That's 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 a very um, segregated system that we can set aside without having to have a lot of strings attached to it and mm -hmm. can trust someone else to, to manage it day in and day out. Give me a report every day that says everything backed up successfully or that you dealt with whatever failures happened, and we're good. We move on to the next thing, and that's that's a 15-minute check in the morning 
while you wait for the coffee to get made type of thing. It's awesome. Brian, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate the I, opportunity. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I mean, Island was a huge secret. Um, I mean, and I'm hoping, I mean, just within this, we're talking, I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, backup and DR. Um, it, it it's, it's, I don't want to call it low hanging fruit in the sense that it's like so easy to actually take and solve this problem. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I really look at it that way. I mean, this is one of those things of like nowadays, you know, like no, nobody, nobody in their right mind is trying to build out their own anti DDoS mitigation service. It's just yeah. like, why would you even attempt to do this? Like, it's so cheap to go solve this problem and, and not deal with it. Um, and I really, I really look at backup and DR in a lot of the same ways um, as that. Good. We do too. Brian, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it.